Hi guys, I'm Bobsy, and in this video we're going to be looking into server authorized network coding. So first of all, before we get going, let's just start by talking about why would you want to go server auth? Because in general, going fully client auth has big advantages in terms of sort of the workflow is a lot easier, the logic is a lot simpler and shorter. But the advantage obviously is cheating. When data is running on the client and we 100% trust what comes from the client, it makes it very easy for them to cheat in the game. I will also just really quickly like to add here that 95% of people working on multiplayer don't actually need things to be cheat proof. So please reconsider if you don't need it to be cheat proof, don't do it. And if this is your first game, please don't make a game that requires anti-cheating. Anti-cheating is really a whole witch hunt of its own and it's near impossible. There's a reason why Counter-Strike, Valorant and these kind of games still have cheaters residing in them. It's because cheaters are extremely talented as well and it's, it's sort of a, a constant witch hunt after cheaters. So especially when it's your first game with networking, that's really not a fun route to go down. Go down a route that'll be fun, go co-op, or if you go PvP, just allow it to be fun, right? There's a lot of PvP games, that, games out there that are great and that aren't cheat proof, but they're still just fun games, right? And that's in the end what matters. Let's just take an example of this, right? Where they can change their own data in the game. So let's say here we're playing this game where we can click blocks and we can damage them or, you know, they can be blocked or whatever. So you can see here I damaged it for 10. And now let's just go from a side of saying that we obviously have the damage on the player. This is a pretty common approach, right? So this would be damage. We deal 10 damage. And here you can see we have the damage to deal here. So let's take it from the perspective of actually damaging, right? So let's go here. So I'm going to start the game like so. And notice when I go here and I click one and we actually deal damage. There we go. I deal 10 and you can also see it over here. So now let's take my player here and let's say that now I deal 50 damage. And then see now when I deal damage, you can see it also was 50 here. This is because we fully trust the client. And obviously fully trusting the client is a bit dangerous. The reason why that's a bit dangerous is, well, as you could just see now, I only changed some value on the client and immediately the game for everyone else was also cheated, right? Which means he was now able to actually cheat his damage. So now the question is, how do we stop him from cheating his damage? Well, the way that you have to think about it when you work with anti-cheating and server auth and so on in general, is you want to think about what data do we trust the client with. For example, in prediction, in, in Pernet's prediction already, pretty much all the cheat proving, at least that goes through prediction, is handled for you, as long as the input struct holds only things that are safe to come from the player. So for example, when they use WAS and D to move around, for example, it's good to sanitize that input to make sure that it doesn't go too big and they can't move too quick, for example, and stuff like that. And as long as you do that, the game is actually fully safe. But obviously this is normal networking. So let's look into how we can actually safeguard this damage. So first of all, there's many layers to actually safeguarding it. So let's say it was some kind of item that was equipped and they could, you know, try and cheat the damage of that item or whatever. But let's assume that all we're actually sending instead is we're sending the actual player clicker that's dealing the damage. That's already a good start. So now if we go into the on hit here, instead of damage, we want this to actually be the player clicker. And I'll just call it the clicker. And this is now also what we'd want them to override. So if we go into the crate here, this one will take in the clicker and the base health here, which will always also take in the clicker. And as you can see here, it needs some kind of damage. Now we're already on the server here, which means here on, we can actually trust value. So if we go to clicker and then we can do dot damage, let's go back to the clicker and let me make this damage public instead. So that way it is gettable. Boom, and there we go. Now logic with the damage is already running through the server and not through the client, which means the client's number here doesn't matter at all, right? He's just sending the reference of who clicked. And then on the receiving end, they're receiving that message of who was it that actually clicked the box. And then the server actually gets the value. Now be mindful, this can be cheated on another level, which is what's very important to know as well, is that this can be cheated on a level of, um, of changing who's the actual player clicker, right? I could click the box and send someone else's data now. So now this is different, but let's just go and show this first case already. So let me go and hit play. And let me go in here. And now when I click, you can see I deal 10. And if I go into here, I can do 200 damage. But now you can see when I click, when it finally gets damage, it's still 10. And you can see, yeah, it's still 10 coming out whenever we actually hit something which is now because we're using the data on the server. So already now the damage layer is now safer, but immediately you can see again, that's also an element of a clicker. So the question is, how do we avoid that? And actually here, we already have a type of attacker. Uh, let me just check what that is, because it's a while since I made this. 
Oh, we already have that. I'm silly. I already have the attacker of type this. But let's actually try and move completely away from this. So let's try and move out of these. And instead, since this is an RPC that we're receiving, we can actually get data in terms of the, oh, not player info, sorry, in terms of RPC info that we'll call info. And if we just default it to default, it'll actually hold some data in here. And we'll get to this in just a second. Now let's go into the eye damageable and as well and remove these and into the crate and also remove these. And now that we no longer have them inside of the RPC, the on hit RPC, uh, which I realize now doesn't have the actual correct override. So let's give it the correct override. Let's no longer make this an RPC and let's make a separate RPC for ourselves. So this will be a private async task of damage result. That'll be on, on hit underscore server, for example. This can take in type of T. And actually, is this used anywhere? I don't think it is right now, but that doesn't really matter. Um, and then we can take all of this, move it up here. And here we can add that RPC info, which I just had. We can say info equals to default. Now we have the RPC info, and this one will just call into this one. So we'll just do a wait of this method instead. So now the player will just call this directly. And I guess we have to return a wait on hit server of type T, just to explicitly set that in my case. Again, if you don't have generic, you don't need a generic. The type T is not relevant in this case right here. Um, but essentially the RPC info is. So what we can do with the RPC info is we know who sent the RPC. This is also some information that we can actually trust. And then we can directly get their player clear instead. Now with Pernet, if you just make 100% sure that you are on the latest version of Pernet, and given you're on the latest version of Pernet, you'll actually be able to use what's called the player identity in this case, which will help you. Now that we're going back into the player clicker, we can make this into a player identity of type player clicker. Now, this is really just a little helper. Again, never be scared of going into Pernet code and seeing what it does. It's just 100 lines of code as a little helper that helps you identify easily that this is a player-owned sort of identity and there'll only be one of each of them, essentially, for the players. So now with the player clicker, you can do this with your movement. You can do this with your weapon script, like if the player only has a signal weapon script or whatever. So essentially, this is something player-owned. There'll only be one of in the scene. Um, and the reason for this is because now we can hear where we do damage. In order to actually get the damage, we can now do if player clicker dot try get player, and then we can get the info dot sender player. The info dot sender will be the player that sent it, and then we can output the clicker. And now we can then do the clicker dot damage like this. So let's go back and test this and make sure that all of this works. All right. So now that we have that set up, if I go and hit play, go into the clone, and let's just go into our player here and set two thousand damage or whatever. You can see once I hit something, I still only deal 10 damage. And now the good side is we're going fully through information that the server is getting itself, right? So it's getting the clicker itself. It's getting the damage itself, which means everything is now running on the server, which means now technically this part is safe. Now you could do the same thing with the timing thing. For example, let's say that they shouldn't be able to click too quickly. Let's say that they shouldn't be able to click too quickly, right? You could have like a fire rate, for example, on your, your weapon or whatever you're using, and you essentially check that and whatnot. I hope that makes sense. So, so essentially, you just sort of force through the server. Another part of going server auth in Pernet, one thing is how the logic moves. Now you choose to move the logic, but another thing is the network rules that you choose to use. So if I go here and look at the rules, you can see right now I'm on the unsafe rules, and the server strict or server owner rules are typically the ones that you'd want to be on for them to be fully safe server strict and you can always go look in the rules see exactly what these means but essentially it's things like only the server can spawn calling server rpcs for example in this case we'll very likely see it here um see the server rpc here get upset because well we're not the owner of this so let me try and go and hit play and when i click something you can see things aren't really working if i enable the console you should be able to see that we're getting errors because well we can't call it because we aren't the owner Right, so we're right now calling it without ownership. So what you might want to do in this case, either, you know, again, you could do this and you can say require ownership false. That's the, the shortcut. The better way to do about it technically would be to already network the click already at the player clicker level, right? So you could have a you could have one here, like a server RPC, which they can call private void, and then you can do on click and whatever they clicked on here, and then all the logic can run already here from the server. In which case you can actually send the, the this information and so on, because again, it's under the server. If you have not watched my ultimate multiplayer video, 
I'd really recommend watching that because being able to follow the logic in that kind of path and, and map it out like that is going to be very important because it's a lot about at least the first 12 minutes of that video because it's a lot about sort of mentally understanding where is the logic running. So having things server auth essentially just means if you want it to be safe at least, essentially just means that you want the logic to mostly just reside on the server and you have to be extremely aware of the logic that you choose to trust the client with. So same goes for spawning of things, take getting values, setting values, hitting targets, are they able to hit them and so on. For example, in the FPS tutorial series, we ended up also converting it to using Collider Rollback, for example, which is a way for the server to essentially check if at that point in time should they have been able to hit them and so on. So there's a lot of things to it and also goes same goes for player movement, also ways to figure that out. But really, if you want movement to be server auth, either one, you have to be okay with a big input delay if you go for a sync input or input sync, or you can go for prediction, which will be responsive, but it's obviously a different workflow. And, and I have videos on prediction already and more will obviously come. So I hope this video was helpful, at least in just understanding sort of a basic idea on how you mentally map out the logic when working server auth. It's really not that different. It's not like you have to work with Pernet in an entirely new way, but you do have to think about it a bit different, move it around a bit differently, and you have to be aware of who's the owner, who's not, and who can do what and so on. Um, so it's really just a good good thing to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to leave a like, comment and subscribe. And I hope that you have a wonderful day.